this week on Hermitcraft. Welcome to the industrial headquarters Whoa! of the Cookie Empire. Oh, that has me excited. Are there grandmas? There's grandmas everywhere. Industrial grandma. <laughs> Welcome to the Hermitcraft recap. My name is Pixel Riffs. Our writer is Loy XP, and captions on this video were provided by Liara. And with the egg hunt event from last week over, the hermits have defaulted to competitive diamond ore placement. You may remember last week resulted in three hermits tying for first place in iJevin's Easter hunt event. Well, the winner winner of the whole competition has now been decided in the final egg hunt. Jevin has hidden a plethora of special edition gold series Easter eggs in a vacant woodland mansion and unleashed the three finalists, Grian, Azumavoid and Hypnotized, to find as many as they can on a time limit. Grian comes out victorious, but shares some of the riches with the other two. Though he just might regret it, given that his own diamonds are about to be gifted to Mumbo Jumbo as a comeback present. Yes, Mumbo is back, and so is Rendog, but only one of them has a pillar of diamonds waiting for him. The story there gets a little muddled, actually. At first, only good times with Scar and Grian were ventilating their riches in a very vertical manner. Then Pearlescent Moon joined in and dominated the scene, and that is when the rest of Hermitcraft started noticing big piles of diamond ore all over the spawn village. I mean, that seems excessive, doesn't it? That seems quite excessive. DocM77 naturally couldn't help but show off how many ores the World Destroyer tech has brought in, but his Tower of Bling quickly became not his when someone put a moustache on it with a note that it's Mumbo's welcome home present, which Scar originally did to Grian's pillar. And which isn't even the only case of wholesale pillar theft, because Hypno has signed as his something that we're pretty sure is CubFan135's diamond block stick. This is property of Hypno fact. You know it's a fact, because the other sign says fact. You really think someone would do that? Just go on the internet and tell lies? Point is, maybe leaving their retirement funds in public like that wasn't the best idea after all. Which is why Stress Monster 101 and False Symmetry don't do that. Well, also because they don't have that many diamonds in the first place, but they're about to if putting the pillar of multicolored glass instead pays off. After all, it points right at their shop and looks curious enough amongst the samey blue lines. <laughs> it looks well cool. It looks quite cool actually, yeah. Well, with that out of the way, let's take a look at all the events and mishaps that occurred on the Hermitcraft server this week. Starting with iJevin, because in light of the diamond rush, it's nice to check in with his full netherite beam beacon project. So far, the overall pile is just started, but only because some of it went into creating three separate sets of full netherite gear as an investment into the whole project. The grind is real, and he might just grind up half of the nether. It helps then that the less expensive metal is farmed automatically now that he has a very productive iron farm in the same AFK area as his creeper trap. Hypnotized might have picked a more fortunate place for his iron farm, at his spruce forest base which might get loaded even when he's offline given how populated the area seems to be. We'll know for sure if a giant wooden letter T will pop up in other people's videos. And that's how baby villagers are made. Even if not, people can come loaded up via the nether portal he installed. Unlikely as it was, Hypno's bee nest farming comes into play after all when Jevin comes around looking for replacement bees for his farm. The incident prompts Hypno to even start his own honeycomb auto farm, honeycombs being the key ingredient in man-made beehives. And from there, he can start redistributing plenty of oak-looking drawers, full of bees or otherwise. <laughs> What's up, Hypno? What up, dude? Not... Dude, you saw nothing. I didn't steal these bees. They're mine. Oh, okay, yeah. Tango Tech's drawers are full of gold, but he's pretty set on fixing that situation. In the depths of heck, which feels wrong to say since he's really on the roof of it, Tango adds a piglin bartering site to his gold farming apparatus. Though this is a piggy market like no other, the machine automates the trading by literally throwing the piglins for a loop. Built like a ferris wheel, the actual redstone is more of a loop-de-loop -loop where piglins are slime block launched in a circle and occasionally given gold to juggle mid-air. While not too efficient, this sure is a bartering farm to behold, even if this might be the wrong kind of spin cycle for money laundering. Listen, is this thing effective? Is it is it fast? Is it is it an efficient way to process your gold? No, not at all. But is it fun? Yes. If only the piglins could sing as well as Pearlescent Moon, he might be flinging beacons at them instead. True to her word, once Pearl is done haste mining terracotta, she returns to Tango and sings him a song of granite and stone so she can go mine those. And we finally see where she's putting them to use, as she time lapses the landscape opposite Impulse's base into the foundations of her soon-to-be alien settlement, during which time we actually see Impulse's base mysteriously disappear, but more on that later. 
Pearl's keen to share insta-mining technology with others, offering some shears to good times with Scar so he can finally take down the cookie monster from his tree. Although the demonstration shears got a lot of the work done too. So, really well. wait, does this mean you'll buy some shears, Scar? Yeah? Oh, you'll... yeah, of course, definitely. Yeah? Just, just, just keep demonstrating this. We also get a flashback to both Pearl and Impulse SV chasing down easter eggs at their bases, although we know by now that neither of them come out on top in the competition. From a business perspective though, Impulse is cleaning up. The rocket shop sales are both in and through the roof, and when XB Crafted comes knocking looking for beacons, Impulse manages to sell him on a fresh new look as well. BAM! Look at that! <laughs> Oh, I'm, I'm, I look good. Mouth, but okay. Sold. Uh, you're good. <laughs> oh gosh, I can't, I can't look at you. <laughs> With the commercial empire managed, Impulse moves on to working on the cultural empire, or the empire as he calls it. And while he sets up a huge courtyard with nether blocks and copper accents to serve as the grand entrance to his dwarven halls, in later footage we see this area scrubbed clean again, so it's clear he has other designs on the horizon and they probably still involve fancy redstone doors. Xbeard Crafted wants the beacons so he can be fully buffed at his base, which is coming together stylistically and mechanically. Reconfiguring his iron farm to filter out and compost the poppies, XB ties both the golem lava bath and the slime farm straight into his storage system via water streams and dropper clocks. He's still finding eggs in unusual places though, and so he figures, why not spread the love around? Since Corralis wasn't able to participate in the Easter event itself, XB takes what he learned from the inventive hiding places of other hermits and thoroughly eggs Corralis' house. I mean, it's, it's obvious, let's be honest. <laughs> We don't know if he's found the eggs yet, but Corralis does find Rendog, freshly returned from a long-awaited stay with family. In the meantime, even if the pumpkin business has been fizzling, the log business has been booming, and Ren is overwhelmed by his share of the profits. It wouldn't be a Rendog business without a campfire, cookout, and some big expansion plans, so Ren and Corralis fly to a nearby island which they plan to take over in the name of Gigalogs. Yeah? Please come and sit down, we're gonna bra and we're gonna talk. We're gonna on my talk way, business. on my way. Hey, there we go. Dang it, I forgot the stakes. Ren also pays a visit to Doc M, who offers him all the deep slate he can save from the imminent TNT disaster, and Cub Fan, who also throws diamonds at him and explains Good Times with Scar's cookie business has become their competition. To retaliate for this corporate turf takeover and Scar's magenta terracotta shenanigans, Ren and Cub adorn one of Scar's trees with the garish pink arrows and frame False Symmetry's eagle for the job. But in the process, they also consider doing some market research on what makes Scar's cookies so magical in the first place. Yeah. Ren, have you have you tried the oven kisses? Um, no. Try try one. Try one. Oh. They're magical cookies. Well, I kind <laughs> I kind of want to take back um our self prank now, but we've committed. So. We're committed now. Cub actually installs some foliage at Scar's other tree as well, just under it for some reason. The mossy green forms the ceiling of Cub Fan's base, which, just like the roots of the mighty tree, also spreads out underground, tunnelling to more and more hermits' homes in a network of secret passages. After all, he will sure need some retreat routes if he keeps pranking at this scale and speed. Especially since they might be facing two elves now. Gemini Tay has also now changed into her elven attire to match the woodland elven base she's planning. Brand new Gemini Tay, ready to build a mega base. Some. It of course fits her already established guardian farm base none, but that's nothing a couple of planter boxes couldn't fix. Now how the villager breeder fits into the aesthetic is less clear. Um, I have a really important question. How do you, how do you turn these off? How do you make it stop making babies? Scar, in the meantime, pronounces Mumbo an honorary elf, which may have been a mistake since he immediately demands an accident every day at the cookie factory. If that sign that says it's been X amount of days since we had an accident doesn't have a big old fat zero on it, I don't want to be at your business. Simple as that. <laughs> there has to be an accident every single day at the places that I shop at, otherwise I'm not shopping there. Safety third and all, Scar proceeds to decorate the soon-to-be magenta tree, as well as developing several distinct flavours for the sweets he will be selling. Though really, with some foods it's all about the texture, so it's a good thing he prepared several custom ones. In our quest to cover Corralis' next video before he even uploads it, we can inform you that he invited Azumavoid to help build some farms on his spruce side island. Though Azuma has his own future base to take care of now that he announced he'll be settling on a snowy mountain, which he of course has already dug up a grid of branch mining under. 
But even still, he can't one block tall dig his way to a taller diamond pillar than Doc with his TNT dupers. I decided to join in and after a few hours, I come back, I find out my diamond stack is pitiful, and then I see yeah. that you joined in. Considering how many flying machines Doc has been building recently, moving a shulker that way came naturally, and he and Azuma team up to steal one from the end city with the eventual aim of making a less OP but more fun shulker farm. I'm going for it. Oh, I'm I gonna... think it's seeing me. Oh god. Did that line <laughs> this up right in my face. Did? At the time of writing, the World Eater hasn't been switched on yet, so the Shulker is still the more aggressive of the two. Expect to see it activated for the first time on Monday's Hermits Helping Hermits, if everything goes to plan. In the meantime, a small chunk of the world below the Gary the Goat statue has already been eaten, but Doc still isn't sure what Gary's actual diet consists of. He even recruits Stress Monster to swing by and kill him for his play ahead so he can feed his own face to the goat, which might count as cannibalism, depending on your definition. When that doesn't work, however, Stress comes in clutch with the correct answer, and Doc is finally able to crack open the redstone to see what was going on under the hood. Seed? I thought, have you tried it? It's fine. I swear to God, if it's seed, I'm gonna blow this thing up. <gasps> <laughs> <laughs> what the? How? While he's distracted, however, he might find the shulker has vanished from the glass display case they left it in at spawn, because Joe Hills saw an orphaned mob without a home and decided to move it into his haunted house. That 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 bullet is tracking me, Scar logged out! <laughs> he was just like, I can't be here for this! He even had a Hotline Miami-style mask on throughout committing this heinous crime, courtesy of a deal with Hypno for a whole lot of birch logs. The logs will be put to work in the playing field for Joe's season-long base, a colossal pinball machine he's building in one of the server's more expansive stretches of water. It'll eventually have scale models of the components, but for now, Joe is living inside one of the pinballs, which is, at this scale, 6 meters in diameter. Joe's other atrocities are committed on ocean life when he unexpectedly creates the Guppy Geyser for a theoretically infinite supply of flying fish, but then teams up with Azuma to raid an ocean monument using an axolotl navy. Some more monumental builds can be found in B-Dubs' neck of the woods, wherever that is, because he's not telling us quite yet. And while you'd think an enormous stone door in a savanna biome would be pretty obvious, especially when B-Dubs provides himself for scale, it took them long enough to find the parkour course that Tango was eventually crowned king of. He also wants to sell clues about the locations of these mystery dungeons, so he sets up a prototype shop in the trunk of his Tree of Whimsy, where people can buy vague hints about the coordinates, if not the exact coordinates themselves, and hopefully they'll take long enough to find these distant edifices that he'll have time to design the insides as well. Who knows? What a clue could it could be! Boy, that was worth 20 diamonds. Notice the price. Very high pricing! Meanwhile, False Symmetry just builds her own castle. Maybe not all of it at once, but gradually more of the wireframe from last week is filled in, textured, and sculpted into a gorgeous facade. This is the first step. I don't actually have a plan for the back yet. Yeah. So, um, ignore the fact that it's gonna be a facade for a while. There's much more to be added there, but False does actually finish a build this week, and hilariously, it's someone else's build. See, Jevin's boardwalk at the starter town just ended a little too abruptly for her liking, so Falls bookends it with a whimsical mushroom gazebo, the whole area leading to Jevin's house already being pretty lush. With the giant eagle there, the overgrown fungi doesn't look out of place at all anyway. On the topic of overgrown foliage, we find False's glass shop collaborator hard at work on her own giant tree. Stress Monster wants to decorate her iron farm, since it's functionally sound but doesn't exactly fit the theme, so despite the spawn proofing requirements, she builds it into a tree. Although she does all this while dressed as Mumbo wearing a flower crown as an eye patch, and we have to wait till the end of the video to find out why. Unless you've been watching Iskal, who has cut all the bell ringing and pseudo cult activity out of Season 7's Hermit Challenges, and decided to just whack someone over the head with a stick and dare them to put on different clothes. Hang on, let me look. Oh my... <laughs> Okay, 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 don't look no! at it too well. Okay. All, all, oh. Our moustache, our moustache, all you need is our moustache. <laughs> I think I've finally gone mad or something. <laughs> it's safe to say Iskel is quite excited about Mumbo's return, so he celebrates by putting together a care package shulker box. But he's got to care for his cave base too, which now has its own guppy geyser, but on the plus side is looking more habitable than ever, with a spiral staircase and villager housing popping up in the stony surroundings because it's a cave base, not a cave base. Seriously, one of the most illogical buildings I've done, though. And finally, there's Mumbo, who returns from his sabbatical to not find his house. Gracious me! 
<laughs> even even my even my base had a bit of a makeover. Honestly, I have I really been gone for this long? At least it takes him a few minutes, and then after getting confused about how eggs work, he decides to make a hole to the bottom of the world, which is ironic considering Doc M's hole to the bottom of the world is about three blocks to his right. But Mumbo, TNT blasting his way to the bedrock, sets up an item elevator to the surface and rigs up a stream to carry all the riches from his future mine into the vault he built in the first few days of the season. We didn't expect Mumbo to look quite so vampiric when he tried on Scar's elf ears, but we did expect Scar to fall to his death at least twice once he saw a giant hole in the ground. And as usual, Hermitcraft delivers with both hands. I reckon you can get to the, the bottom of the hole safely. Yeah, it's, it's called uh, friction, Mumbo. Ever heard of it? I, I mean, I have, but not in the way that you're doing it. You're doing it in quite an aggressive fashion. And that's about it for this week's recap. Our writer is Loy XP, and my name is Pixel Riffs. Captions on this video were provided by Liara. Don't forget to leave a like on this video while you're still here, and subscribe so you won't miss future recaps. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.